Fine. I'll turn it over to Rudy. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Matt. Uh, good morning. <clears throat> I, can I have the first picture, please? Okay. This is the APX spectrometer mounted on Sojourner on Earth, and the next one should show you how it looks on Mars when it was taking uh, data from Barnacle Bill. Next one, please. The upper image shows you the rock that we have taken data on, and the lower image shows you the position of Sojourner. Unfortunately, uh, you don't clearly see the APX docked against the rock. There's a left eye picture where it is better uh, visible. <clears throat> uh, that much about the scenery. Now, as far as the data are concerned, <clears throat> the whole project went so smooth so far <clears throat> that many people might have been taken to believe that <clears throat> this is a hoax. Uh, <laughs> uh, there was a film made many years ago, I think it was called Capricorn, where NASA was putting up state <laughs> Well, we can assure you <clears throat> it's not a hoax. If I can get the next image, uh, here is a diagram of elemental ratios <clears throat> and the many data points plotted in there. Uh, they represent basically uh, samples from Earth. And if I could learn how to operate this, I again can't. Can you? Oh, here it is. So this is, this is terrestrial samples lined up here. Uh, this collection of triangles uh, is data from meteorites believed to come from Mars. Down here you have one data point, uh, which is Viking soil, the soil measured by Viking. And the red dot is Barnacle Bill. We are on Mars. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we get excellent data. We have especially good X-ray data. <clears throat> And uh, that makes my colleague, Tom Economo, from the University of Chicago very happy. <clears throat> it was mainly his task to build that X-ray channel. Uh, the next slide will show you <clears throat> uh, an example of Barnacle Bill's X-ray spectra and how uh, Tom has been preliminarily decomposing it. Uh, we have actually not had such good data in the laboratory. That's mainly due to the fact that on Mars it's much colder than we ever uh, to cool the instrument when we took a uh, uh, spectra in the lab. Uh, we have slight problems understanding the alpha data. The data are also excellent, but they include... Well, while we're looking at this very unusual and very hard for me to understand diagram of what Barnacle Bill has made out, we're going to take a quick break. We're going to come back with the live pictures of Mars in just a minute as Talk Back Live continues. That will show you... Uh, what my boss, Heinrich Wenke, in Mainz, <clears throat> and uh, chief geologist, Emil Jagutz, think that Barnacle Bill is like. Forget the upper row, because that's just uh, an analytical data. Forget even the block of data where they have broken it down into mineral phases. Mainly, they say, this rock consists of a, about 60% a rocky phase and 40% of a mafic phase, because the color is black. Emil thinks it could be an impact mill. Uh, Hap will tell you a lot more about the interpretation of these data, but this is just front-end, first preliminary opinion <coughs> of our people back home. Now, that's about all I wanted to tell you about our data, our instrument. I just wanted to make another small note. Uh, <coughs> this X-ray spectrometer that gives us such beautiful data is another example <coughs> of the very successful application of the cheaper, faster, better approach. Uh, the actual detector is a Japanese photodiode that costs six dollars a piece. Uh, and the whole detector package that includes this detector plus a preamplifier, all mounted on a thermoelectric cooler, uh, then a collimator, a thin beryllium window, and all of this in a hermetic uh, metallic can, <clears throat> uh, runs for about 20,000 bucks. Thank you. Welcome back to Talk Back Live. We're going back into NASA's briefing on the latest pictures from the surface of planet Mars. Hap McSween is an expert on meteorites and earth rocks, and he is looking at Martian rocks to see how they're the same or how they're different. Let's listen. Dirt clods in there are possibly small rocks. I think they're probably dirt clods. Uh, but it's a pretty clean uh, analysis site. Then here's Barnacle Bill, which was uh, A3. And notice particularly that the left-hand side of Barnacle Bill 
has some red dust on it, uh, which complicates tremendously any interpretation of uh, the chemistry that you get because the APX only analyzes the very surface layer. But the right-hand side is very dark and very clean. And we hoped that the rover team was going to be able to put the sensor head on the right-hand side and that the arrowhead marks the spot as best we can tell. Uh, so I guess this proves that luck will be skill and cunning every time. Uh, so we think we have a nice clean rock surface is, is the point and I think we can uh, it, at least it, we can interpret it uh, unambiguously from the perspective of, of not having too much uh, dust contamination. Um, next slide, please. Uh, first, I want to show you the A2 analysis, which is the soil analysis. And uh, one of the uh, difficulties with uh, chemical analyses uh, is getting absolute concentrations, absolute values, and it's often easier uh, to get uh, a, an accurate portrayal of what's there if you do a ratio of two elements. And so all of these elements on the bottom of this diagram are divided by the concentration of the element silicon. Uh, and what you see here is the red squares represent the average of the Viking soil analyses, and the yellow dots represent uh, the soil analysis at this site. Uh, and can that be moved up? There's an iron uh, dot at the top of the figure that isn't showing. It's way, uh, you know, trust me, it's right off scale, right up here. Uh, but all of these things are incredibly good matches. In fact, the only thing that differs a, uh, a little bit is sulfur. Uh, the sulfur in, in this soil is a little less than the sulfur uh, in uh, the average Viking analysis, but the sulfur in, in the Viking soils bounced around. So uh, what this means is we have now analyzed, uh, we have soil analyses from three different places on Mars, and they're virtually identical. Okay, now let's look at the rock. The next slide, please. Um, again, these are element ratios. Uh, this is a ratio of calcium to silicon uh, on the vertical axis and iron to silicon on the horizontal axis. And these three elements are all uh, determined with high precision by APX. The APX uh, can reach these very easily. I've shown on here uh, in blue uh, a field for uh, basalts on the Earth, the most common lava type that forms the ocean basins, the floor of the oceans, and, and a lot of the continents. Uh, and then there are some blue dots here labeled ultramafic rocks. These are rocks that form if a basalt starts to crystallize and you remove those crystals and make a rock out of it, then what you have is an ultramafic rock. And because the uh, Martian meteorites, the SNCC meteorites, the samples of Mars that we think we already have in hand, are all basalts or ultramafic rocks, we figured that's what we would be dealing with. Uh, on the right-hand side shown in, in uh, red here are uh, the analyses in terms of these three elements of all of the uh, SNCC meteorites. Uh, these right in here are basalts. Uh, this one down here at the bottom, ALH84001, is, I suppose, the most famous meteorite on Earth by now, in that that is the one that has been suggested to contain vestiges of ancient Martian life. Um, and here is Viking. Well, the new pictures from Mars are about two or three minutes away, I've been told. We're going to take a break for that long. Come back and show them to you. Stay with CNN. Hi, welcome back. The briefing continues. They are almost done with the charts of the chemical composition of Mars, which if you're a chemist, you'd be very interested in. If you're me, you find it hard to keep up with. Uh, in the audience uh, during the break, people were saying, how much titanium is there? Could they use it for rocket fuel? And the answer is yes and maybe. But it's going to take me, at least, a couple of hours to analyze this data. Um, while um, Hap McSween, the, uh, uh, the Mars rock, Earth rock expert, continues his presentation, um, we, can, uh, we can listen in again. Maybe he's done with his charts. And I would tell you that the fellow who has been doing the great Martian picture show for us uh, day after day after day is Peter Smith. He's kind of the poet of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And he's going to pop up 
and talk about the probe raising its head lazily up. And I mean, he's really good at this. And uh, he's the next guy up. As soon as he comes up, we're going to see the new pictures. And that's what I'm waiting for. So anyway, we can go back and uh, listen to Hap for a couple more minutes, and then Peter Smith will be coming up. Well, and we get virtually the same result. Uh, the rock is roughly maybe a third quartz. Quartz is the mineral, the white mineral that forms beach sand quite commonly. And it's about a third felspars. Felspar is the most common mineral in the crust of the earth, the continental crust of the earth. And it's about a third uh, pyroxene. Now, uh, it is not clear that pyroxene is the real mineral there. That is the mineral that's calculated in the norm. But that mineralogy, that assemblage of minerals and those proportions of minerals is also consistent with the assignment of this rock as an andesite. So to conclude, uh, if this rock is a volcanic rock, then we would call it uh, an andesite. It is also possible that it is not an igneous rock. It is not a lava. We are not sure yet. Uh, I, I lean towards that interpretation because the rock looks, looks a little bit like Swiss cheese and the, the holes, uh, we think, are what are called vesicles. They are gas bubbles that typically form in lavas. But there are other ways to explain this Swiss cheese texture uh, due to, uh, to, uh, to uh, weathering uh, that, that uh, might explain it as well. If it's not an andesite, then it is a mixture of several rocks. It could be a mixture, uh, it could be a sediment, a sedimentary rock derived from particles of, say, a granite mixed with particles of basalt. That would give you a composition that would be much like this. Or, uh, alt and that could have been done uh, in water. You, you carry these particles downstream and then redeposit them and compact them into a rock. The other possibility is that you sampled two different kinds of rocks like this and mixed them in a large impact event. And indeed, on the surface of the moon, uh, many rocks are what we call breaches. They are physical mixtures of materials that have been ground up by impact and then re-cemented. Uh, so we can't say for sure yet whether this is an igneous andesite or whether it is a mixture of several rocks. And uh, we hope to get high resolution images coming down very shortly uh, of the texture of the rock uh, that might uh, help us with this. Uh, let me conclude by saying that um, I sure didn't expect this, but I think it's very exciting. Uh, and I look forward to looking at some of the spectra of some of the rest of these rocks. This site really is a rock festival. And uh, I think, I, I, and I, I, to tell you the truth, I was scared to death at the, at the beginning of this mission because uh, when the first uh, information came down that the spacecraft was sitting level at, at some, a two degree slope or something, I could just see mud fest. But, uh, but this has turned out to be very, very exciting and I think we're gonna see a, a real uh, collection of, of rocks, a real smorgasbord of rocks here when we get more data. Thank you. Okay. Now, Peter Smith will tell you about uh, some latest imaging. 